what we what we going to explore a little bit I think I think today is the um, the transition to technology rich environments both at home and in the workplace creating certain tensions where you see an increasing gap between the skills that people possess and the skills that people require in order to to lead productive and and happy lives um, here I mean, particularly focusing on Europe Andrew um, at the OECD Andrew is Director of Science, Technology and Industry at the OECD. And they've been really looking at this, this skills gap phenomenon in some depth. Generated new data, and we're going to hear from Andrew in a moment um, what that data tells us. And then we'll have a discussion thereafter, interactively, hopefully, with people around Europe on our screens behind us about how we're going to improve the situation for the future. But first, I'd like Andrew to kick off. Maybe you can give us a, an overview of what, what the OECD data suggests. I'd be happy to. And let me, first of all, say good morning to everyone and just how happy I am to be here at the new center. I want to congratulate Microsoft. But not only on the building, it's really the Youth Spark initiative. I can think of few things more important than this initiative. I don't have to tell this crowd. ICTs are everywhere. They've transformed our economy and our society. As a consequence, uh, the jobs of the future will all be in this area, whether it's in a localized ICT sector or just broadly everywhere, wholesale, retail, the automobile industry increasingly. Yet, do we have the skills ready for this challenge, or are we running a big skills gap? The mismatch problem. Um, well, uh, my colleagues back at the, the OECD have come out with a new survey of adult skills for the first time, actually, that comparative international data for uh, adults from the age of 16 to 65. Uh, and within that test, we've asked a number of questions, and some of them zero in on numeracy, literacy, problem solving, and technology-rich mm -hmm. environments. The survey was run in 23 countries, and in every country, we asked uh, a minimum of 5,000 people about their problem solving and technology rich capabilities through a battery of different questions. Now, let me start with the bad news. The bad news is the survey of adult skills shows the majority of people that we survey, the blue parts in this chart, either lack the basic skills necessary to function in technology-rich environments, or opted out of the test, which was a computer-based test uh, mm -hmm. in entirely because they lacked the computer experience. On average, across countries surveyed, only 6% of the population, the dark green part in this chart, had the highest level of ICT skills. And let me tell you, when we say highest level of ICT skills, we're not talking about a Microsoft computer scientist. These are very basic foundational skills. Accomplishing the task at the highest level meant nothing else than navigating across pages using some tools such as a sorting function to solve a problem. For example, people with solid skills could book a meeting in a reservation system, which required the test taker to understand and use the information from a novel uh, program, send several email messages, and to communicate the outcome by email. People with medium skills had to be able to use a spreadsheet, extract a number from that spreadsheet, and convey this information through email. OK. Now, the slightly better news <laughs> is, especially for the young people in the room, uh, as we've said several times this morning, it, you are the hope. Uh, the gray part of this bar shows the portion of the population scoring that level two, which is the medium level skills I was just talking about in the problem solving and rich technology rich environments. The blue part were the higher end, the so-called level three. Now, uh, as you can see, the young adults, the 16 to 24 year olds, scored far better than the older uh, adults <laughs> when it comes to problem solving technology rich environment. And anyone with a teenager at home completely understands this uh, immediately. Uh, what's not displayed here are those with the really low scores. Uh, below two, where the gap is very huge. And what disturbs me here is the bottom part of this chart. When I look at countries such as Ireland, Poland, and the United States, where not even half of the young adults accomplish the low scores. Hmm. The good news is 
These skills can be taught and learned, and that's why the Youth Spark initiative is so important in my mind. Now, looking at the full sample of people aged 16 to 65, you can see that those with tertiary or university skills uh, level of education are most likely to have good ICT skills. By contrast, again, sorry, here's the tertiary. By contrast, those with the lower levels of formal education, older people uh, in particular, uh, we're most commonly associated with the lack of the core digital skills. Now, but even amongst these tertiary graduates, only about half of them were reasonably comfortable with new technologies. And again, we're not talking about high-end uh, skills. These are the so-called foundational skills that these tertiary graduates uh, don't have. Thus, we're facing a world in which large numbers of people face real challenges to reap the benefits of the digital age in terms of jobs, access, and even basic things like social exclusion. Let me end with the current cover on The Economist. If you didn't see it, last week's edition, I highly recommend reading it. I think they got it right. Countries are not ready for today's technologies and their effect on jobs. Countries need a skills strategy to ensure that they become ready to develop and deploy the skills and to succeed in an ICT or digital economy. Achieving these goals, of course, will re represent the collective effort of government, businesses such as Microsoft, and civil society to join forces for a new digital skills strategy. OECD stands ready to take part in boosting these skills across the OECD. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrew, for that, that, that sobering, that sobering <laughs> insight. Um, I, I guess I have a question for Brad first, and that would be, how do you think um, the private sector industry is, is uh, prepared to meet these trends? Well, I think, Stephen, it's a great question. And one thing is clear, this is not a problem that the private sector can or should solve by itself. I think it's a problem that the private sector can help solve uh, in partnership with people in government, uh, people in NGOs, and not surprisingly, given what Andrew just showed, perhaps most importantly, with people in education. You know, it's really educators who have the opportunity to take the lead, and I think we in the private sector can then help and support uh, and equip and provide resources for them. Um, we've had a chance to see um, some of this firsthand, really, uh, uh, across Europe. I think one of the most interesting examples is where you have teachers working even with very young students um, there's a great example from Portugal, from Colegio, uh, the Colegio uh, Monteflor, where teachers are working with students who are as young as six. And oh. I think we may have Portugal with us this morning. Uh, we may have a teacher to join us. Uh, Portugal, is there, are you with us? Uh, you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, and we see you, too. Oh, wow. Okay. Hi, Brad. Uh, first of all, I would like to, to thank you for this invitation. Uh, it's an honor for me to be here um, showing the work we do in our classroom and uh, uh, showing a little bit of this project related to Kodu. Do you want to hear about, about the project? Yes. Uh, okay, uh, this project is called Kodu Cup at Colegio Montflor, and uh, it's a project uh, focused on the use of Kodu and on the use of coding with six years old students. Uh, we are talking about a project in which we will challenge pupils to create a game, uh, and it involves three steps. Uh, the first step, uh, they will create, they will uh, group, be grouped. Uh, uh, they will be grouped uh, in pairs, they will work in pairs, so they are uh, collaborating all the time during the, the project. And then they will design the game um, with Kodu. They will design the game and create the game. At the same time, they will uh, explore the game, explore the software to start coding with six years old, don't forget. Uh, and then they will share their, their games with the others. And together, we will decide uh, which one is the best game of the classroom. So. It's important to use coding in this age, but it's also important to promote creativity and critical thinking and collaboration, other uh, 21st century skills that it's important for our students to develop 
uh, for the future. Uh, I don't know if, uh, if it's clear, but uh, if you have questions, please ask me. Well, thank you, first of all. Um, you know, what is the biggest impact that you see working with such young students on coding? Well, uh, first of all, it's, um, it's inter interesting to see how these kids suddenly they understand uh, technology. They understand that the computers need someone to uh, program uh, them. So uh, they are using uh, coding and they understand the importance of coding. Well, they, have, uh, they are six years old. Maybe they don't understand the impact in the future, but they realize that uh, if we are surrounded by technology, we need to, uh, we need to learn how to program uh, the computers. And as I said before, uh, the coding is important, but this project is more than that. It's about coding, but also about collaboration and creativity, other uh, 21st century skills. Well, thank you. Yeah, I think you put it really well when you talk about this as a set of 21st century skills. Uh, because I think in many ways, the 21st century is a software century. And it's the kind of thing where the skills these students are learning will make them more capable at doing anything in life. But I think the other thing that's important for everyone to recognize is that software isn't just important for people who want to work in the IT sector. I mean, you had the example of automobiles. Uh, I think software is going to be important for basically the creation of anything in this century. And so the students that you're working with uh, I think especially by starting at the age of six, are really getting a head start to pursue just about anything in life. Yeah, uh, Brad, I have a question for you. Uh, what, uh, what can these students uh, do with coding in the future when they grow up? Well, I, I really think you name it, they'll be able to do it. I mean, you, just, you, you, you look at a, a, a wonderful country like, like Portugal, there's probably no business that will be untouched by software. Um, and therefore, by the time you know, they're entering the workforce, you know, the skills that they're acquiring today are going to make them more qualified you know, for everything that, that the country is, is focused on doing, whether it's manufacturing or services or you know, you know, tourism or you name it. Um, so it, it, it is, I think, a role model for what, frankly, should inspire us uh, across Europe and around the world. I think it's remarkable. Okay. Mate. Hey, really? I don't know if you want to ask them something. I can ask them if you want. I can ask what, and see what they are doing uh, in the computers. Sure. We have maybe one minute. So if there's one okay. person who would just like to tell us what's it like okay. to go to school and Gonzalo. learn to code. I will ask Gonzalo here. He's uh, coding now. Uh, uh, I'm, I will ask in Portuguese, then I will Terrific. translate his, his answer, ok? Uh, Gonçalo, uh, o que é que tu gostas de fazer uh, no, no Codu? O que é que tu gostas mais de fazer? Gosto de fazer jogos. Fazer jogos, e mais? E fazer jogos e ensinar os colegas. Ok. Uh, uh, Gonçalo uh, answered that uh, I asked him what, what is uh, his, active, his uh, favorite activity with Kodu, and uh, he said that he loves to program. And uh, another thing that he likes to do is to teach the others, the, teach the teacher and teach the students. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, uh, so I think this is very important that the, 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 role, the, the roles in the classroom are changing. Uh, these lives are changing of these students, but at the same time, the roles in the classroom are changing. The teacher is not only the teacher, but it, it's, it's a learner too. So I think this is very important. Well, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for spending a little bit of time this morning. It's clear that we should let both of you get back to teaching. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank uh, you. Um, but thanks for spending this time and, and making us all a little bit smarter. So thank you, Portugal. Okay, thank you. It was a pleasure for me. Wow, that's, I mean, that's absolutely terrific, isn't it? Yeah. It's just amazing, six and seven year olds. And I think it would be interesting to find out from, from both of you, um, Andrew and Brad, whether we're facing the same challenges. That was southwestern Europe. What about central and eastern Europe? What, what do we see there, Andrew? Uh, I don't really see anything unique, to, to tell you the truth, although you, you can see that Poland scored reasonably low on our scores. But it, it, it's, I think it's endemic to every 
part of the world, uh, and we see it. It's, I wouldn't pick on the diversity within Europe, because I think, as Brad would tell you, that we have the same diversity mm -hmm. in the United States a, as well. And so I think it's a, a, a general issue for every country at this point. Well, it's interesting, Stephen, because you know, in Central and Eastern Europe, we've had the, uh, the good fortune uh, of partnering with some really strong NGOs who've been doing some work in this area. Um, there's one in particular that is able to join us this morning. They're focused on a link to the future classroom in Poland. Um, and I think Poland should be connected with us. Let's see. So if we go to Poland. Yes. Yeah, th and this, yes, Hello, there we go. And this is, this is Merrick, you know, who uh, heads Microsoft citizenship work in Poland. So, so Merrick, uh, welcome. Nice to have you with us. Yeah, good morning, Brad. Good morning, Andrew. Good morning, gentlemen. Welcome to Poland. Uh, we've heard great uh, about great projects in Portugal. I am absolutely convinced that we are doing great things in Poland, too. We are in a beautiful small town uh, called Barcin in the central north part of Poland, now covered with snow. Uh, we're in a public uh, library, which is a new building. You can see it. I am surrounded by 25 uh, young uh, students from, from lower and higher secondary schools. And the purpose of this uh, training, of this interactive workshop, is to support those young uh, uh, students uh, to better plan their future life, their future careers, to plan them in a comprehensive and, and really creative way, uh, taking, taking into account developments of information society and the knowledge-based uh, economy. So we have here interactive quizzes. Uh, we have here a meeting with a young professional. Uh, we, we just went through the online uh, ICT uh, skills um, self-assessment uh, skillage. You can see computers be behind, uh, behind us. Uh, so the purpose of this whole exercise is to help young people better understand the needs of the future labor market, yeah, because it's changing so rapidly. So there's really good creative atmosphere in the, in the meeting. It, the whole project, as you, Brad, mentioned, is done under the umbrella of uh, Microsoft's uh, YouthSpark and linked to the future program developed by our partners, Information Society Development Foundation. I think it's worth mentioning that in the first edition, we organized three hundreds of meetings like that all over the country that gather over 10,000 young, uh, uh, young uh, students. And uh, in the second edition, which is taking place at the moment, we simply want to double this number. And just lastly, you know, 85%, over 85% of young um, people told us that it was really helpful uh, to, you know, open the eyes on how the labor market of the future will look like. And what is particularly um, uh, important uh, to me is that over 60% of them declared that they need to improve their ICT skills because they know that like 90% of future jobs will have built-in important ICT component. And some of them already declared that they will study ICT. So that's a good, good meeting. Yeah, here we are. So thanks, Marek. It's Stephen Collins here. I think um, Andrew Wyckoff from the OECD, he's, uh, he's keen to ask you a question. Thank you. Tell me, why do you think it's important to address skills development, digital skills development, outside of the school system? <coughs> Uh, that's a very good question, you know, uh, because uh, someone may uh, have a false impression that uh, uh, that's a kind of a competitive activity towards the formal education system, which is absolutely not, you know. Um, there are various uh, serious reasons uh, to um, address uh, skills development outside school system. First of all, we have a big challenge. Yes, uh, in all countries in Europe, we know that, uh, unfortunately, unemployment among young people is higher than the country numbers, which is a bad thing. Yeah? We are listening to those uh, bad, frightening prophecies of sociologists of so-called lost generation. We simply cannot allow that. So any effort to accelerate you know, diminishing of this number of unemployment among young people is the, the right one. And, and uh, trainings like that uh, simply support it. Secondly, I, I would point out uh, uh, to a phenomenon which we well know, which is called uh, IT consumerization. And I think that we know that uh, uh, young people spend uh, 
much more time in front of their PCs, tablets, smartphones outside school, in their private time. Yeah? And uh, in many cases, they are what I call consumers of IT, which means they are building their social networks, uh, they are entertaining them sam- themselves, and our objective is to convince them to be a little bit more what I call IT producers, which means to, to create mm-hmm. software, for instance, to create hardware solutions, uh, to acquire by this practical exercise skills that will give them a personal competitive advantage in the future. And thirdly, you know, uh, there is a, there is a gap between the formal education system and the current needs of labor markets. Yeah, curricula, educational curricula, uh, have some inertia between uh, built in, and of course. Uh, employers highly value solid academic background, but they need also practical skills that will make the young employees uh, immediately profitable. You know, and this is something that can be done outside the, uh, the school system because of flexibility. So, just summing up, you know, it's. Uh, something which is not competitive, but it's complementary to what's done in schools. Interesting. Hey, Marek, do you have a question uh, for uh, one of the panelists here? Yes, uh, Brad, we had a conversation. You know, that's a fascinating meeting, I must tell you. know, I, I, I feel myself like 30 years ago when I was actually 17, yeah, and I was thinking about important choices in my life. So we had a conversation during the break, and I know there are several questions uh, uh, um, in the room. Uh, who would like to be first? Ada. Uh, how can computer science be more funny for girls? Yeah. So diversity, Brad. Yeah, that's- <laughs> Great no, I think that's a great question uh, because we were talking earlier about how women are underrepresented in the ICT sector. Um, and Merrick made an, an important point. Everybody's a user of these products, but not a producer. And I think our goal should be to ensure that there are as many women in the production of this technology as in the use of it. So to answer your question, Um, There's a program that we've been working with uh, around the world called DigiGirls. And a lot of women who work at Microsoft have gotten involved in it. Uh, They've been really interested in becoming teachers. And I think one of the things that can make computer science more interesting to girls is to frankly have the opportunity to work with women as role models. Uh, And to hear from their personal experiences and Uh, understand what kind of options and choices uh, they thought about and why they chose computer science. So I I think we need women both to teach computer science, but to show other people and inspire younger women and girls um, to follow in those footsteps and, and make this the more diverse industry and profession it really needs to be. Thank you, Brad. As you can see, you know, over 50% of this group are young women, yeah? So That's we good. need it. Thank you. That's a very good. So th- thanks very much, Marek, for uh, sharing, sharing an alternative training solution outside of the uh, traditional classroom. It's been uh, great linking up with you all today. So have a great day, everybody there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So it's interesting. We've 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 spoken we've spoken here focused on the first the first two links about really around digital skills and Andrew your your data also I think focused on digital skills. One thing we haven't addressed up until now, um, really, although uh, Minister Fremont uh, of course addressed this in her speech, is around this area of encouraging entrepreneurship and this is a particular persistent weakness we see we see in Europe. So even with the skills, what is it that we can do to, to change, really change the culture, this fear of failure, this desire to take risk, this desire to really want to create your own company and be an entrepreneur? What are the things you think we can do there, Andrew? Well, I, first of all, I'd like to think that the entrepreneurial mindset differs a lot across Europe. You see pockets where it's really mm-hmm. strong and others where it's more weak. But I think events such as this one can help. I think it comes with the youth to some degree. But I think there's some... Uh, uh, responsibility on the part of policymakers too. Things such as bankruptcy laws uh, kind of can do away with the fear of failure a bit and the availability of risk capital, which is important for a lot of entrepreneurs. I actually just add that while the U.S. is heralded as a home of entrepreneurship, there are numbers show a decline recently over the last decade as well. It's interesting, and Brad, from the private sector. 
Well, I think one of the things we obviously need is this combination of skills. I mean, it's easy to talk about ICT skills and coding because you obviously you can't really pursue a career in this space unless you have that basic building block. Um, but you know, as we're talking here, you, you need more. Um, and you know, this focus on entrepreneurial skills is, is really fundamental, I think, to the creation of a more dynamic European sector. Um, and you'll be surprised to hear, by coincidence, this is our third and final opportunity to connect with another group across Europe. Um, you know, we've had the opportunity to, to work with a group in Italy, and lo and behold, magically on the screen. <laughs> Roberto Coco uh, from Microsoft is working uh, with Junior Achievement Young Enterprise. Um, so you know, tell us a little bit about what you all are working on in, uh, in Italy. Thank you so much. Good morning from Italy. We are here in a wonderful place called Monticello Brianza, near the lake, and we are here at Istituto Greppi. Uh, with this school, we are doing a lot of work, and we have been working with the staff of the school to migrate them to Microsoft Cloud Services. In this school also, there is a great project called uh, Impresa in Action, that means Enterprise in Action, which was developed together with Junior Achievement Italy. Junior Achievement is one of our main partners in Italy that is helping us addressing uh, youth unemployment. As, as you told, uh, unfortunately, we have uh, the uh, problem to offer IT skills to these youth in order to help them enter in the workforce. With Junior Achievement and this specific project, uh, we are offering uh, these uh, students uh, trainings on IT, but at the same time on something that can help them in uh, develop their own company. So how to set up a business plan, how to leverage their IT skills to do something successful, how to help them uh, making concrete an idea that they have. And it's uh, fantastic to see how these youth can work together because maybe one has the idea and another one can code the idea and mm. so make it real concrete. Today we are here with uh, two classrooms, so we have about uh, 40 students which are a representation of the project they are developing. In the project, they spend two hours a week specifically on Impresa in Action. So uh, during the morning, I had the great opportunity to speak to these youth and to see how they are developing these ideas. And they are definitely great. That's great. I mean, Andrew, do you have a, you have a question for, for Italy? Yeah, Roberta, I'm, I'm curious, uh, given the fast pace of how the IT sector is changing, how do you keep your students, entrepreneurs, uh, up to pace uh, with these skills? Yeah, thanks for the question. I ask uh, Federico to begin answering this question, please. Our everyday life is uh, close to last generation devices, smartphones, tablets, yeah, Xbox, digital devices are more and more essential in uh, our everyday life and they symbolize the future. At school, we use uh, cloud services like uh, SkyDrive that allows us to share knowledge in uh, real time. Microsoft also helps us sharing this technology such as Dreams Office, Office 365, but not, not also we use uh, Skype and Link. We are learning with uh, junior achievement think, to think as entrepreneurs, and we are using a lot of cloud services. Thank you. That's great. But we also have a question for you, because uh, these students, you know, are very energetic. So we would like to ask you one question and ask Valentina to do it for me. What are, for you, the three top qualities of an entrepreneur? That's 
three top qualities. Of an well, you know, as somebody uh, you know who's been fortunate to spend a career working with, uh, you know, frankly, one of the great entre entrepreneurs of our generation, Bill Gates. Um, you know, there's three things that that stand out in my mind. Number one, don't be afraid to fail. Um, the reality is you, know, you, you have to actually be prepared to fail in order to take the risks necessary to be an entrepreneur. Um, and there will even be times when you may fail or you probably will fail, but you have the opportunity to learn from that failure and build and do something even bigger. So number one, don't be afraid to fail. Number two, it's still good to have a plan. You know, think it through. Um, you don't want to go out and try to fail. Uh, you know, try to succeed. And, and, and success really does require that one have a spark of an idea, um, learn how to put together a business plan, um, think through the various scenarios, um, and, and do your homework, uh, I think, is, is really important. And, and number three, um, be persistent. Uh, it takes a lot of hard work. Uh, to be a successful entrepreneur. I mean, it is not something that you just get up in the morning and do for two or three days and you, you magically have a, you know, a, a billion dollar or a billion euro company. Um, you know, you have to, you, you know, in, in some cases, you know, keep trying, trying again, keep working um, and being persistent. But, you know, if you are prepared to take risks, um, if you can think and, and, and have a good plan and, and you can persist, um, that's a pretty magical combination, and I think that most successful entrepreneurs have built their success from that combination. That's great. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for this great opportunity you're giving us uh, to share with you our experience. Well, thanks to all of you. I mean, you, you are doing great things in Italy, and you're, I think, an inspiration for all of us, no matter where we, we live and work. Um, so thanks for, for joining us, and yeah, obviously, uh, as the work of, of Junior Achievement Young Enterprise really demonstrates, it's these kind of partnerships with NGOs that really make uh, all the difference. So I just want to say thanks to you, thanks to the groups uh, in all three countries, and thanks to the technical teams uh, and their use of Microsoft Link Connections to bring all of this to life and connect us, not just with the people in the room, <coughs> Uh, but with three different countries on a single morning. So it's terrific. Thank you all. Well, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a kind of mixture of now of relief and regret that, that we end this session. Relief that the Eurovision Song Contest uh, worked three times 12 points for, uh, for the three countries. But I wanted to thank Brad and Andrew for their... their really thoughtful insights um, into what is uh, one of the, the biggest issues really facing, facing this generation. That's great. So let's show our appreciation for, for the speakers. Thank you. Thank you.